good afternoon, everybody. Apologies uh, for the delay. Um, we uh, will be live streaming today via uh, University of Lahore's Facebook account. And this link will be shared on uh, uh, UL's Twitter account. So please, uh, during the proceedings, please feel free to share that link on your own uh, social media accounts and spread it as much. Uh, we'll also be recording uh, the entire event. And this will be edited and made available uh, to everybody and will be shared further. Um, I um, am happy to introduce the moderator today, Mr. Jaz Heather, who uh, is not a new face for University of Lahore. And I would now uh, ask him to uh, introduce our discussions today and uh, start uh, the session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ravya. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to uh, be here and moderate a discussion on uh, Dr. Akhtar's book. Um, I was uh, on the way to the university. I just sent a WhatsApp message to Dr. Akhtar and it listed a few books. The Roots of Rhetoric, Politics of in India and Pakistan, Genesis of South Asian Nuclear Deterrence, Learning to Live with the Bomb, Pakistan 1998, 2016, Meeting Grass, The Making of the Pakistani Bomb, Brokering Peace in Nuclear Environments, U.S. Crisis Management in South Asia, The Blind Eye, U.S. Non-Proliferation Policy Toward Pakistan from Fort to Clinton. And then I said, this is the sum total of Pakistani literature on the nuclear side. And fortunately, three of the authors are here. Uh, and we are obviously discussing Dr. Aftar's book. But Brigadier Farooz Azam Khan was one of the discussants. Uh, he wrote the book, Eating Grass, The Making of the Pakistani Bomb. So he's essentially done the work of Ebna Khan for the Israeli bomb and George Perkovich for the Indian bomb. And it's an extensive uh, exposition of where we started and the entire trajectory. Uh, Dr. Moeed Yusuf, uh, who recently put out a book, in fact the first one which actually has a theoretical model um, and it was uh, published by Stanford University Press. Frida uh, Khan's book was also uh, published by Stanford University Press. Um, so, so the idea is that Back in 1998, when we put the, the bomb, we took it out of the basement and put it on the shelf, uh, cliched though it might sound, uh, one expected that we'd probably start looking at uh, what had happened and how it impacted our strategic placement, uh, how we could add value to this, if at all, but uh, for various reasons, uh, we haven't really been able to do that. A lot of literature, uh, journal articles and the rest of it come to us from Western scholars. So we have to be grateful to these uh, four or five authors who have managed to uh, treat the subject from various perspectives uh, to sort of, you know, have a few books at least uh, on the shelf which are from the Pakistani perspective. So today's book, of course, is Dr. Rabia Akhtar's uh, book, The Blind Eye, uh, story of uh, US non-proliferation policy towards Pakistan uh, from uh, President Ford to President Clinton. Our discussants, as I mentioned, uh, Bira Faroz as is one. Bira Faroz uh, was uh, the first director of Arms Control Disarmament Agency at the Plans Division. Uh, but before that, uh, he um, commanded uh, units and uh, brigades uh, along the line of control also, Siachen also, and also uh, on the western side. Uh, Ms. Saima Aman, the senior research fellow, uh, CISS, is the second discussant. So what we are going to do is that I will ask the discussants to speak for about 10 minutes each. And then we will ask Dr. Rabi Akhtar to give us uh, a summary of 
her book. Uh, why did she think that it was important to write this history? And of course, the fact that this is this is actually a seminal book that way, and one would perhaps expect others to follow suit and to take the story further from where uh, Dr. Abhi Akhtar has uh, ended it. So uh, may I ask uh, Ms. Aman to kick off uh, with her discussion of the book? Would you like to go first? Okay. Um, thank you, um, Jaz. Distinguished uh, guests uh, of the University of uh, Faculty of the University of Lahore, um, Excellencies and Ladies and Gentlemen. Um, before I begin talking about the book, at the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Rabia, my mentor, uh, and the University of Lahore for affording me this opportunity. And uh, I have to say that I am, it gives me immense pleasure, and I am very overwhelmed to be sharing this panel uh, with uh, Firosa. Um, also, um, Dr. Abhya was uh, my um, teacher. She taught me at the Fatma Jana University when she was heading the program <coughs> uh, almost a decade ago. Um, no time. pressure, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I must also say that although I have uh, reviewed some manuscripts, this is the first one that I am um, presenting before an audience. So, um, it is a very humbling experience. Um, the book, I would say, is a timely addition to the literature which promotes a new prism to look at Pakistan's pursuit of the bomb during the times of changing US non-proliferation goalposts. Blind Eye, as the name denotes, provides a riveting account of the US-Pakistan nuclear relationship, and I quote, how the US enabled the creation of nuclear Pakistan by turning a blind eye to its nuclear developments at the height of their alliance relationship during the 1980s. What Dr. Rabin is doing is that she is apprising the readership through the story of the US non-proliferation policy towards Pakistan, which has several takeaways. And the first takeaway, that, as I see it, is that the compromises made by the United States to accommodate Pakistan and its inconsistency in enforcement of non-proliferation legislation has implications for the efficacy and the success of the US non-proliferation policy with the prospective proliferance. Second takeaway as I see it, more importantly, is that this story of US willfully turning a blind eye towards Pakistan's nuclear program, thus enabling Pakistan to get away with the bomb, does not find space in Pakistan's narrative, because the story hasn't been told yet. <coughs> the book is the first academic account based on primary sources, that is archival data from the US National Archives, declassified documents from each of the presidential archives, declassified digital national security archives, reconstructing for the readership the story at several levels. That is, the changing preferences of several US administrations, the overall strategic environment, the evolving non-proliferation laws globally, as well as within the US administration, and Pakistan's security considerations, and the resolve which was reflected through its leadership for acquiring the nuclear capability. Um, Basically, the book talks about uh, five US administrations, non-proliferation policies, beginning from Ford to that of Clinton. The timeline is interesting because from the Indian p &E in, which is the peaceful nuclear explosion that India did in 1974 onwards to after the overt nuclearization in 1998, it is crucial for understanding the history of the Pakistan-US relationship as it evolved. There are several questions that uh, the book seeks to answer. Um, Number one, was the US non-proliferation policy towards Pakistan a case of selective enforcement of US non-proliferation laws? Second, what did Pakistan get out of the alliance during the period of engagement when it was developing its nuclear weapons? And finally, how did Pakistan get away with the bomb at the height of the criticism of its criticism of the US non-proliferation policy? Uh, interestingly, the book opens dramatically, recollecting for the readership the US-China rapprochement uh, by recalling President Yahya's handwritten wrote to the Chinese ambassador to be delivered to Cho Enlai, the Chinese premier, outlining this secret plan that formed the basis of the opening of channels of communication between US and China. It then introduces the US-Pakistan relations, highlighting the long trend of, quote, mutually negative misperceptions, unquote, of the two countries for each other. And that is an important theme that you know, ca is carried forth through the book 
at various allegorical levels. The novelty of looking at the US-Pakistan relationship as a mutually beneficial relationship in which both countries used each other to get what they wanted, Pakistan more than the United States, doesn't fail to surprise a Pakistani reader who has mostly believed that this relationship with the US has been that of a client state. However, the blind eye convinces the readership through its presentation of the historical facts that Pakistan achieved more than it had bargained for. It not only modernized its conventional military capability through US military assistance, but also developed a threshold nuclear weapons capability at the height of its engagement with the United States in the final decade of the Gold War. It was made possible due to the minimal interference from the five administrations, quote unquote. There are a few things that, are, that I think are worth mentioning from the conclusions of this book. The author writes that Pakistan's quest for nuclear weapons affected its relationship with the United States since Pakistan was challenging the global non-proliferation norms that were championed by the United States. The argument is right, and the reason I believe is that the United States uh, failed to give the security assurances that Pakistan was seeking in 1965 and 71. For assuring its national security and preserving the strategic stability, the development of the nuclear weapons was in itself an end. The author answers the questions she initially put forth before the reader in the conclusion succinctly when she says that, and I quote, a systematic historical examination of US non-proliferation policies towards Pakistan using archival data from presidential and congressional archives reveals a peculiar pattern which shows that although the non-proliferation policy by each administration was designed to create an imbalance in favor of Pakistan not going nuclear, it ended up with achieving just the opposite, unquote. The blind eye also highlights the continuing tension between the US Congress and the executive. The author writes, Within each administration, the Congress exhibited its apprehensions about Pakistan's nuclear proliferation. Yet we see that it preferred giving aid to Pakistan with non-proliferation conditions attached. On the other hand, the executive valued the security relationship with Pakistan, and it, uh, the waivers cleverly enshrined in the US non-proliferation legislation enabled the executive to turn a blind eye to Pakistan's nuclear acquisition and development. Pakistan benefited from this disconnect that resulted from the good cop, bad cop relationship, which was played by the Congress and the executive. One cannot but appreciate the candor with which uh, it is admitted that, and I quote, all the manipulation, the deception, the duplicity the West blames Pakistan for was Machiavellian art, which history taught us to achieve national security objectives. Um, the book argues that the US failure to prevent Pakistan from achieving its nuclear weapons capability was not a policy failure, but an enforcement failure. While all the five administrations from Ford to Clinton pushed Pakistan to choose between aid and the bomb, however, in doing so, the administration prioritized its foreign policy over non-proliferation, and such tools could not have influenced a determined, the determined behavior of a state that was adamant on seeking a bomb for its security. It is an effective critique the book, I mean, on the US non-proliferation policies, and it, could, and it concludes, and this conclusion I think is important, that Pakistan's popular narrative needs a reset with respect to the objectives and the successes of the US non-proliferation policies towards Pakistan. Um, I'd like to talk finally about three takeaways as I see them. One is that it is the US who compromised its own non-proliferation policies to achieve its foreign policy objectives in different times under different administrations. The author rightly pointed out that while giving Pakistan choices, US prioritized its foreign policy goals over its non-proliferation policy. And there are several instances within the book that talk about it. The Soviet invasion in 1979 came as a blessing in disguise for Pakistan. As Pakistan and the US became partners in the fight against Soviet expansion, the Carter administration reversed the Symington Amendment to achieve its foreign policy goals against Soviet Union. The relations between Pakistan and US under the Reagan administration were much easier than the previous administrations. While asserting the US campaign and ousting the Soviets from uh, assisting the US in its campaign, Pakistan continued to work on its clandestine nuclear program. The author minces no words when she writes that Reagan's waiver of the solar sanction in 1987 was strategic in nature and not a favor. The US needed Pakistan on board for agreements to finalize the settlement of the Afghan situation. After the Soviet defeat in Afghanistan under the senior Bush, 
Pakistan witnessed more damaging sen sanctions under the Pressler Amendment, and there was a feeling of betrayal within Pakistan by, of the US. However, what is interesting to note here in this chapter is that the Bush non-proliferation policy, uh, it was the Bush administration was making attempts to find ways to bypass the Pressler Amendment to accommodate Pakistan's security concerns. Similarly, the story of the U.S. turning a blind eye towards the, uh, during the Pakistan-North Korean missile episode with the enactment of the Brown Amendment, which resulted in the re release of defense equipment for Pakistan, is another story which reveals that the U.S. changed non-proliferation goalposts because of commercial reasons rather than, quote unquote, for the love of Pakistan. Second uh, takeaway is that the book bursts popular myths that all the US non-proliferation laws were targeting Pakistan or were Pakistan-centric, if I were to say. During the Ford's presidency, the Symington Amendment wasn't solely aimed at Pakistan, but a result of a broader non-proliferation evolution of US non-proliferation export control policy, aiming at countries like Brazil and South Korea that helped take the focus off Pakistan. The third takeaway is that the historical narrative manifests Pakistan's commitment and political will of the civilian government from Bhutto onwards to that of Sharif, which remained completely firm for the cause of achieving a nuclear capability in the face of all pressures and against all odds. In Pakistan, the history of Pak-US relations is generally approached through the heightened sense of disgruntlement and a feeling of abandonment, totally sidestepping the gains Pakistan also accrued while being a partner. Owing to the sensitivity of the issue, many shy away from writing on such subjects. Therefore, I would say that this book is a major contribution by the author to reorient the apologetic nature of the Pakistani narrative on the issue of US non-proliferation policy. It is a successful attempt in presenting a not so popular narrative on the US non-proliferation policy towards Pakistan, one in which Pakistan benefited from the US blind eye towards its nuclear weapons development. And this narrative is one that seldom finds uh, appreciation in the historiography of Pakistan's nuclear weapon development. Also, I cannot finally but endorse the author's regret in being constrained to present a story that is one-sided. In the absence of declassified documents, providing an official Pakistani perspective on the issue that I think is also crucial. However, let us hope that this excellent work of histori historiography of US non-proliferation policy towards Pakistan generates hope of realistic and wholesome appraisal of US-Pakistan nuclear relations of approaching the issue from the Machiavellian school of thought, leading to Pakistan shunning away from the apologetic attitude that it has in approaching the issue. I think I'll stop here. Thank you, thank you, Saima. Um, one of the counterfactuals, so if you actually compartmentalize and, uh, and make uh, the US foreign policy and the non-proliferation policy as two distinct uh, entities, then the counterfactual would be what would have happened if the Soviet Union had not come into Afghanistan or what would have happened if 9-11 had not happened. So I think we'll, uh, put that on the table and uh, once we get into the open discussion phase, then we could perhaps address this once again. Um, Brigida Khan, sir, uh, if you could give us your perspective on the book. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yaz. Thank you, Dr. Rabi Akhtar. Thank you, uh, friends, audience. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, for, I believe, for the second time here. Thank you again, University of Lahore. Uh, pretty pleased there. Uh, <clears throat> Let me tell you a little context of my little review that had, because uh, Sam has already stolen my thunder, so I have to really now extract my rainfall from a different pattern now. Thank you, excellent comments, by the way. Uh, so I will, I will try to. Um, and thank you, sir, for your kind introduction. One part of introduction is that it's been 18 years that I'm in the US as a professor, so I've almost forgotten my military life. So I. I've got to put on my scholarly hat today rather than the military one uh, in, in this regard. Uh, Ravi and I go together, uh, particularly for this kind of book, uh, in a very peculiar way. When she was doing all these research, she and I would be on the phone all the time until our cell phone batteries would be dead. Because I was doing the research for eating grass, and she was doing something similar, which was so complimentary in, its, in, in terms of research. And I did not know that there would be another sort of eye-catching 
title like Eating Grass, Blind Eye, you know, these are the very captive title of the book that will come out of here. Um, and it is so, so that's one reason that I'm very subjective in my comment if I say that this work is so much complementary to everything we did and the way we shared our thing. I put it this way, um, eating grass, blind eye, and this gentleman sitting here, uh, crisis, uh, bargaining. This, these are three, in, in a musical parlance, three songs of one rag. Rag emans se dikle teen geet hain. Because the story is the rag is the same. It's the way you put it together. So aapko jhalab, you will find the reflection of that in each of them, and each of them. I believe it will not be complete without each other. And yet I tell you, rag chalta rahega. It will not end because this is not the end of it. These are primer for historiography. It's never an end. So that's my first comment that you know what you and I have done basically is to put together to trigger your mind you know and personally no other book has been so nostalgic for me because as I was reading page by page it was reminding me of my own research and the people that I was talking and I'll just mention who, why it is so important that we record what people with memories say um, when I, I came here on the day your book was launched in Islamabad I was jet lagged but I was listening um, one of your very insightful comment was that there is no um, tradition of declassification of documents that you can find your own history, the kind you found there, which has been the critique of my book from Malia Lodi when she, when the book was launched and she was saying that, you know, your book is not covering the nuclear diplomacy part of the Pakistani diplomats. And so are you saying the same thing? And I said, well, that's one piece which is missing because the Pakistani perspective of diplomacy, we don't have the culture of declassifying what happens. So how do we get that? The long list of people who are there. And uh, I, I get a chance to also sort of promote my book here. Thank, thank you, Rabbi. <laughs> so, so, so she mentioned so many names, which brings me nostalgic reasons for, for the fact that all those people, or most of them, are, are no, more, no longer living. So what they said and you captured, Sabzada Yaqub, I spent hours in interviews with him, Aga Shahi, many interviews that I did with him. Kim Arif, I believe he's still alive but can't talk much. Sayyid <coughs> Rafaqat Ali. I mean, I got go on a list that you, Ulam well, we didn't interview, it was past when the book started, but I'm telling you the people that I interviewed during the 2000 who were living, and the stories that Tanvir Ahmad Khan said, these are the people who were really in it. Most of them who are cited are no longer living. So I'll be quoting some of the things if you give me time to a little bit to say what I have to say. And then the US people, you know, I mean, we talk about Tom Thornton and Dr. Brzezinski. Uh, Dr. Brzezinski was my thesis advisor when my, I was doing my doctoral candidate uh, at, at Johns Hopkins University. And all those things that, and Tom Thornton was the South Asia professor, so Dennis Cox when I was Woodrow Wilson Center. So I, I'm making it very personal because these were the people who talked to me a lot across the table that your book actually captures what they wrote. But they said a lot more. So if I sort of, you know, so that is sort of thing. Then. I'll give you three small key observations and give some specific insight to kind of incite you guys you know, a little bit. Blind Eye, the title of the book and the central question that she poses uh, is basically, and as the Simon points out, I'm personally a little agnostic about this whole idea, whether it was truly a blind eye. And the question that arises from the very catchy title is, was it the smart Pakistani statecraft chickenery that did it, or was it the stupidity or really ignorance of the United States? That question remains in the gray area, which is the one that, depending upon whose narrative is there. And since I'm there in the United States most of the time. The primarily critique is essentially that the US looked the other way around. And if the US had come down very hard at the time, Pakistan could have been made, quote, the horrible example that has been so. And I can talk more about that as well if you have a question. And that, that was the whole idea at the time, uh, that this would be the case of uh, I, I call it the non-proliferation age, because the, uh, as distinct to the nuclear age, but that is the beginning period where the book actually starts, 
about the non-proliferation age. And the second point was, which actually the book answers, the, the title answered itself, and I think both introductions that national security considerations will trump non-proliferation concerns or any other concerns for that matter. That is such a supreme objective, whether it is for Pakistan or for the United States or any other country. I mean, that's where this whole answer to the whole thing is that it's not a blind eye, it's about security concerns. I think Simon, you've loved it. And there's a third thing which actually she implies, and, and I'm going to say that very really rather bluntly. The non-proliferation age was not about stopping the spread of nuclear weapons. It was about who's a good proliferator and who's a bad proliferator. And that's as blunt as that. And actually, that's where the whole picture was uh, becoming that, you know, this whole debate between the contradiction within the US system was how to treat Pakistan as a more security a, uh, a country which has much more security uh, importance or a country of concern. And that country of concern essentially was, was that a Puritan mean that non-proliferation in of itself is bad spread of weapons, simply horizontal proliferation, or is it good for some and not good for others? And I think that's, I think it nails it out in, in that sense. Let me come some of the specifics that you make and I'll be provocative enough to tell what you can answer that if you don't mind my saying that. And I've really got a lot of points to say because you, you trigger a lot, you know. So I go ear-wise, you know, and, and something that, uh, you know, ear-wise that you have mentioned, you know. Um, in the 1970s, when the book begins with the two administration, that was an era. By the way, when I look at your ages, most of you were not born, so many things you remember because you lived at the time when this was going on. When your children will grow 10, 20 years later, you will see that your children will be told the history that you saw today being spun in a different way. You say, no, it wasn't like that in 2017. In 2034, you'll be telling this, mark my word. This is what happens in the 70s. You live to see what was going on at the time. The non-proliferation regime was evolving at the time when US was in domestic crisis. So it is managing its domestic crisis. It is managing Cold War. And it was really facing these challenges, whether how to preserve its own national security interest, but at the same time become the leader of the non-proliferation world. And that was difficult then, and I believe it is difficult now. It's not that easy. Because when, it, when you become nationalistic about your own interest, and then you have concerns to be leader of the world, I believe the United States has always failed, in my view. And that's what happened, because it is the nature of state, nation-state system to preserve its interest more than be a leader in the process. And that's what happened in the larger sense. Um, but having said that, at the time when, when Rabi covers the span, it was a big deal of national foreign policy. I'm not trying to trivialize that it was a small thing. It was a big deal. And therefore, that's where my skepticism came. General Assam was a little skeptic too. Was it really a blind eye? Not quite. It, they gave a very hard time to Pakistan. Put it the other way, a large number of people in the US asked me the question, the same question the other way around. Um, what might have happened, what the counterfactual, as you put it, what might have happened if all these pressures were not there or all these geopolitical dynamics had not happened? Do you still think that the Pakistan would have achieved the program? My answer is that yes, but not as quickly as it did it would have been a much more longer time frame. Uh, the, the time that you were in, in the mid 80s was the one, you got the bomb, um, but it might have been 1990, 95, it would have been a slow paced, but that motivation was not related to the speed with which it happened. In fact, the more obstacles that came in the way of Pakistani program, the more it actually sped, sped up the program. And that is where this whole regime, that's my take, and I, I don't know if you'll agree on that or not. Uh, 1980s was an era where, you know, it was really between real politic and leadership, and it was clear real politic was trumping, uh, trumping that. But I think the most important part, which is written, your book ends around Bush administration, and since you mentioned about this is the two era, post-World War immediate and post-9-11 world. This is the different non-proliferation world altogether. Clinton administration, this is a unipolar world. It could dictate the world in its own terms. And this is the era of arms control uh, where topical issues 
that would be irrelevant during the Cold War became even more important now. So these topical issues were the whipping boy of the time, you know, human rights, non-proliferation, this and that, you know, these things. During the Cold War, nobody bothered about that. And I think that's, again, turning its head again now in the terms that human right is selective for some and others are not. These are all part of that, you know. A um, couple of things that I just want to, because I can keep going on and on. You mentioned something about, uh, one thing that struck me about uh, that you should, um, Mr. Aga Shahi's uh, remark that you write in the book, and which is where my take and my interviews slightly differ. Uh, Reagan administration and President Zia had a deal. It was a nuclear deal, which is analogous to a deal that was struck by Israel, Golda Meir, Nixon deal. It's analogous, it's not equal. It's a different kind of deal. And if any, or Rabinovitz, you mentioned about her, she interviewed me for that, and she sort of makes this comparison about the non-proliferation age as to how the deal was struck. And, and her thesis talks about that, but in particular, I wanted to bring that, this is not in your book, but you can't write everything I understand. What happened in 1981 deal was, it was very smartly, very, very smartly and cleverly negotiated uh, by President Zia and his team, KMR, Vagashai, and some others and others. That is really, that history needs to come out more at some point, you know. The Reagan administration's deal was a four-point deal as to how to defeat the Soviet Union. And those four-point deal was, number one, to revive the 50, 1959 bilateral agreement. I think you deal a lot in your book on that. So that was one Pakistan demand that came back, uh, the 59 agreement. The second was, the U.S. will not interfere in any domestic politics in Pakistan. And the third was, which is where I have a little difference of opinion about what Aga Shahi writes about was, that it will be the Pakistani intelligence and Pakistani establishment that will execute the Afghan Jihad and not the CIA directly. And, and the Pakistan will be using that, which Aga Shahi says somewhat differently, when we know from fa fact that, that what happened then, you know. The fourth element was that nuclear issue will be kept on back burner, and that is where I don't think it was as blind an eye as it's, it is believed here. So it was a still a very important issue for every reason that Rabia books, uh, cites in her book about Solares and Cranston and Glenn, and everybody was really. And look at the, the politics and, and, and um, the, the house changing in, uh, and the administration at the time. So the nuclear deal was very specific on four counts. So there were four big deal, and nuclear had itself had four big deal, and those four point deal was no nuclear hot test, no transfer of technology, nuclear know-how. On the highly enriched uranium, the deal was that uh, they would not enrich beyond 5%, four or 5% this. Yes. And the fifth was whatever highly enriched uranium has been enriched, will not be machined into core, into bomb. So here comes the blind eye. There was no way to verify that. And that's what the, the embarrassment threshold that President Zawla could tell that, you know, you trust me. I think you cite something that it was stove piping here, the lack of coordination that is going on at the national, it, does, it happened in all countries. I'm not blaming Pakistan, it happened in all countries. When your scientists are speaking loud mouth and the proliferation people are really doing right into the heart of the United States, knowing fully well, look at the disconnect, that's what's happening. And I think you cite down a lot as to how this whole Pressler and other thing actually revolved, essentially were, you know, people were getting caught inside the United States and Canada. Arshit Pervez was one name, you named a couple of other names in that. And at the same time, the top most Pakistani scientist is speaking loudly and openly professing it. So you can see the disconnect as to how that was happening. That was one thing I wanted to just bring out. And people mostly think that it was Kuldeep Nair's interview that came in 87. There was an interview before that, and that was in 1984, during the peak of the Siachen and Amritsar crisis. 
and that was the time when Ekyu Khan gave an interview to Nawai Vakht, by the way. And that's 84. And if you, if you link, because that became an issue because he spoke to them. Uh, when the program is classified and the national policy is to deny that there is a, there's a nuclear weapons program, how is it possible in the country that an Indian journalist can really reach the top most scientist in the world, in, in the country, and interview him? That's the question that, you know, I'm looking at the security aspect as to what happened. That disconnect was pretty huge. And I talked to a lot of people who were at the time saying that that was a very big point of embarrassment for the Pakistani administration at the time. I just wanted to flag that part. One more point you mentioned about um, about 1990 crisis, and we do a lot of crisis thing also. Um, by the way, you won't let me forget my book, Nostalgic, because every third page you quote from meeting grass, so that, no. that actually brings an it's really flattering for anybody whose book is quoted so many times, but Mochi will say that it's out of context, but you were not out of context. That's the, that's the best part, so thank you, you know. It's very really rare. So there's the disconnect as to, because the only person living in all that thing as to whether a nuclear threat was given to India, and then what happened physically here that triggered Preston Amendment at the time, later on, and that created the sort of crisis. Uh, well, during the peak of the summer crisis, there were activities deliberately done uh, at Maripur and F-16s, and deliberately uh, things were moved. Whether they were actually moved or not, it was as part of the signaling, and the explanation given was to us was that this is like displaying resolve. Uh, you know that a deterrence is about resolve times capability, so if you don't have capability and you are actually resolving, that's even more kind of, uh, you know, it, it falls even more flat. The truth of the matter is that in 1990, uh, you could not have delivered a nuclear weapons from the wing of an F-16 aircraft at that time. It took a little time more for that capability to evolve. That's my position. Maybe others might disagree with this, but that was the conclusion that happened that this is, this is one of the reasons why it was being dismissed at the time, uh, at the other end. Because your book is citing two other people not really concerned. Uh, but this is what was the idea that you, know, you wanted to rattle so that the American satellites pick up and then tell the Indians that we are jumping the gun. So that was one crisis that was. That was a bad way of signaling at the time, in my view. And again, the threat to India, that was again something that I want because those people are not living. Uh, I've never seen anybody so flatly denying and turning red in his face and so vociferously, angrily denying that he ever would be in a position to go and do naked threat to India. I'm referring to Sabzada Yaqub's conversation with I.K. Gujral in 1990, which has been referred in many Indian press and other press that Pakistan had actually sent him to threaten nuclear work. He denies. And uh, he denies very angrily. And I believe that be the case. However, there were other interviews who said to the contrary that this was a policy to go and convey to India. Uh, we cannot really verify whether they were in that meeting or not. Uh, but there's this contradiction between what was said. And, and I wanted to bring that point, point here that uh, in fact, I.K. Gujaran and uh, Sabda Yaku were sharing poetry, and he even gave me poetry, what he actually said that. So uh, one has to believe that it was not as naked as it was, as it was brought about. I think I might have taken too much time, but I think I'll, I'll stop here. I've got a lot more about Zia Kassinger and so many other things, but you know, let me stop here. Because, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Brigadier Feroz Hassan Khan, and now we turn to the author herself to give us the genesis and purport of the book. Thank you so much, um, Saima and uh, Brigadier Feroz, um, for your very, very generous comments. And I'm glad that both of you read the book um, to the last page. Um, so this uh, is an extension of um, the work I did at Kansas State University for my PhD. Um, 
being part of the security studies department there, which was an interdisciplinary between history and political science. Um, you could not have written a dissertation unless you had a, some primary sources. So uh, for that, one had to go and look for primary sources. And I did not have any formal training of going to the archives, taking out the box, looking at the document, and then interpreting it. So my supervisor, Dr. Stone, David Stone, who is now a Naval Postgraduate in Rhode Island, uh, he uh, literally gave me the initial uh, you know, lessons on as to what does a document look like, what is the process, how do you file in order to go to an archive, and what do you do with it once you have it. So I have almost more than 5,000 original documents uh, that were just images that I took because I didn't have that much time or money to spend uh, you know, in, in, that, in the town where the, these presidential libraries were. So took a lot of images and made files of them and just kept them away. Um, and it took me an entire year to just read them. Not making any connections with what was happening, but just read them and keep filing away, okay, this is this year, this was happening, this is that year, that was happening. And when it came to writing it down, I literally uh, had a meltdown because it was so difficult to, um, to write about it. And it is probably the most difficult thing to write history because you are responsible, like you said, probably years down the road, uh, this will be read, and when you are interpreting history, you are responsible for what you are telling the next generation as to how they need to remember as to what the events were. And my predicament was that as I was reading and I was looking at those documents of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto's letters to Ford, um, and then General Zia's communications with Carter, when I looked at their signatures, their assalamu alaikum greetings and all that. So, so it, was a, it was a very emotional experience. And I used to think that, you know, so I am sitting in the United States and I have access as a Pakistani to these documents. But back home, no uh, Pakistani has access to what their leaders wrote. What we have in Pakistan is their word of telling us as to what the policy entailed, what the, were the minutes of the meeting, and then they are you know, published in the newspaper. So, um, so I was left with a one-sided story that I had to tell. And given that the PhD program was of a limited nature and my Fulbright scholarship only accorded me that much time to be in the US, um, I did not have time to conduct interviews because I had those 5,000 documents to interpret and then write. So I, my go-to Bible, thankfully, was uh, Feroz's book, Eating Grass, because Feroz had conducted a lot of interviews for his book, and those were all primary sources for me, and of those people who, whom I did not have access to. So, um, so that is why, sir, you cited so heavily um, because you are my source. Uh, you know, although for me you become secondary, but you have conducted primary source interviews, which were very, very useful for me to use as plug gaps of where I lacked information from a Pakistani perspective. So I am really, you know, grateful to you for your excellent, excellent work. So overall, uh, this, this story, as you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's written in a, a story format. Uh, like I said, writing history is not easy, and this is not perfect by any means, no, nowhere near. Uh, now that I have read it again, uh, it could have been written in a much better format. Uh, but anyway, it's out there. So um, the blind eye, as uh, you know, Saima and Brigadier Feroz mentioned, um, is not that the US did any favors to Pakistan. Uh, the title Blind Eye um, you know, was, was the convenient title to be used for this. 
because in one of the meetings with Carter, uh, this, uh, this term terminology had come up, it had been used, and in literature on Park us and on non-proliferation, blind eye is very commonly used. Um, so the idea to look at this was that now, now that I have all these documentation from the US side, and I have evidence that it was not a favor to Pakistan that the US turned a blind eye. It was a matter of them prioritizing their national interests. Uh, and they had to use Pakistan. But the story as we know of Pak-US relations when we grow up is that of victimhood, is that of Pakistan being used and abused by the United States. So when I was going through all those documents, that sort of did not gel. And so I decided to write it in a manner in which I wanted to see as to what did Pakistan get out of it. And Pakistan's diplomacy, as Brigitte Feroz has mentioned, was top notch. You know, each diplomat, each leader, whether it was civilian or military, did not compromise on this one national interest. And if that took lying, if that took uh, deception, uh, whatever name you want to give it, they did it because they believed um, that Pakistan needed this deterrent at that point in time. Um, so all of the, you know, people like to say it's a compromise U.S. made, but it was a clear priority orientation um, that, you know, United States had to use Pakistan in order to get to where it did. Um, the interesting part of it, the learning that happened during this, uh, you know, exercise was that uh, I had met uh, Senator Pressler, uh, did an interview with him. His archives uh, are going to be open, sadly, until, uh, you know, they won't be available until after his death. I do not wish death upon him. Uh, but. Um, I got a lot of material on Pressler Amendment uh, from John Glenn's archives in Ohio State University. And because Glenn was, as I write, the main architect of what was later called as the Pressler Amendment. Um, to what you have mentioned, uh, Brigitte Feroz, about the 1990 crisis and all, so I uh, obviously am not looking at as to what the crisis is. Um, what I am looking at in context of Pressler Amendment is whether Pakistan possessed the bomb at that time or not. And the signaling through that interview that came out, whether it was deliberate or whether it was impulsive on Aqiu Khan's part, or whether it was an embarrassment, automatically triggered sanctions because of the wording of Pressler Amendment, the sanctions that were going to come out if it was confirmed that Pakistan possessed the bomb. So, and I have gone into greater detail to explain as to what the legal uh, definition of possession, um, you know, uh, that was entailed when the amendment was uh, being worded, that was really, really cleverly done so that the executive during Reagan administration's time had the room to um, create some space for Pakistan because they still needed Pakistan. So it has been, um, I think, a very rewarding relationship for both Pakistan and United States. So I do not see it as a relationship which uh, has been lopsided. I think Pakistan really, really played its cards well. And uh, yes, there have been tough times. We like to say that Pressler Amendment, um, you know, they kept RF-16s. I've talked a great deal about it on that as well. Um, but the blind eye that was turned probably to me was most important during Clinton administration's time. When um, there was evidence on Pakistan's uh, North Korea trade, Pakistan's China trade, um, uh, and they had evidence on as to that this development is far beyond anybody stopping it. Um, yet the economic concerns at that time um, did not allow Clinton administration to use that evidence to again sanction Pakistan. And they went to all, all to every extent to uh, create more room to alleviate uh, the, you know, uh, problems Pakistan, Pakistan suffered because of the Presser Amendment. Um, so I, I think we should uh, open the floor to 
for some question and answers because there's a lot that one can talk about. Thank you, thank you. Um, of course, we want to open it uh, around the table. Uh, at least uh, two people, Brother uh, Khan and Dr. Akhtar, have talked about the inability uh, of our scholars to conduct research in Pakistan. Um, yes, but here's the thing. When Zia was there, uh, at some point he read this book by uh, Professor Steve Korn, uh, The Indian Army. And uh, Zia said, well, you know, I'm going to get this guy. And so Steve was invited over. And they basically opened up everything for Steve Korn in order for him to write the book that came out as the Pakistan Army. And then, of course, Zia was the first to ban the book because he wanted a few lines taken out, uh, especially where there were references to, uh, to Israel. Uh, the Strategic Plans Division also gave access to David Sanger of the New York Times. And he came and he wrote a chapter, which wasn't particularly uh, laudatory. Uh, it was heavily critical and at places um, unduly critical. So I remember writing an op-ed in, uh, in Daily Times, which was titled, Kala No, Gora Yes. <laughs> so if you want to do research as, as, a, as a brown Pakistani, it's extremely difficult. There have been a lot of talk about Right to Information Act and in theory, uh, there is a Right to Information Act, but woe betide if you were to try and invoke that because it takes you nowhere. And as far as declassification is concerned, to the best of my knowledge, there is no standardized procedure for declassifying documents in, in Pakistan. Um, I once wrote a series of uh, articles in the Friday Times on uh, reconfiguration of the Pakistan Army, and I got a call from General Quarters, and they said, well, this is a great effort, but you have gone wrong at, at all these you know, various places. And I said, I'm sure I've gone wrong, because sitting in Pakistan, it is easier for me to get data on the US military, on various other militaries in the world, uh, but there is no data on the, on the Pakistani military. So how do you conduct research? So much of the research that is being done uh, in, in other areas of history, you go to the uh, Congress Library or you go to uh, the UK and you, you pick up documents from there from the time that there was a British Raj. So obviously, uh, those are some of the things that we need to uh, consider very seriously if we want to have serious scholarship uh, in Pakistan. Um, history is, uh, as AJP Taylor said, it's essentially boils down to the child's question, what next? It's fascinating. And I think uh, uh, eating grass also uh, and uh, blind eye also, uh, these are works that, in fact, they're the only works that actually tell us <laughs> what happened. And uh, of course, there is uh, there's further room for, for more research. But these are seminal works. Uh, they provide the plinth on which uh, others who come can actually build uh, uh, an edifice. So you've heard the discussions, you've heard the author herself. Let's kick off with some questions. G. So my question is to look rather at uh, comments from the viewers are also welcome. So please share, uh, share with us what has been the role of uh, non proliferation monitoring agents for the relationship between uh, Pakistan and the United States during this period when Pakistan grew nuclear? Was it a compromised silence or what? You wanted to ask a question. We'll take yeah, sure. three or four. I just wanted to congratulate Dr. Lata for uh, such a wonderful book. My con. My con. So, 
I'm Dr. Kushbu Jaz from Canadian College. And uh, I just want to congratulate uh, Dr. Rabia, my friend and my old boss <laughs> at FJWU. You have uh, written um, an excellent book, and I think that it will, uh, it will be one book which our students can read, and uh, they, should, uh, they will definitely learn from uh, this work. And uh, as far as uh, uh, Mr. Feroz Khan is concerned, I think your work is that work which we have been using uh, since uh, two decades. So your papers have always uh, been primary source. So thank you, sir, for uh, writing on this is these issues. Thank you. Gee, anyone who has a question? Gee, Dr. Dr. Um, Things. One just on a lighter note. Um, one? one on a lighter note to add to your Steve Cohen story. Uh, it further goes that Steve Cohen, when he was here after the book was banned, asked Ziaul Haq, "Why have you banned this?" And he said, "Well, you have Israel and etc. in this, so our people are very sensitive." And then winked at him and said, "But you know, Professor, now it will sell much more." Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, uh, incidentally, he also gave a, a, a rug to Steve Kahn, uh, who, when Steve went around, he was told that it's, uh, it's pretty sort of, you know, ordinary. <laughs> There's not much to it. Um, so a couple of things. One, um, you know, this idea of, of research and the difficulty of research. I mean, all of us are in the same boat. I don't think I could have written my book sitting in Pakistan, and the book was on, uh, on Pakistan and India. Um, I think the problem is deeper than what, what you've suggested, declassification and all of that. The problem is that the field of research is seen as a vehicle to promote pre-cooked narratives rather than investigate. So I always tell my students that the worst researcher is one that writes the conclusion of a paper before the introduction. And that's the concept of research in, in this country. That's fundamentally the problem. I think you can get access to anything and everything if you guarantee that you will write what somebody wants to read. So, you know, I think the problem is deeper. Um, one comment and one question. I'm not entirely sure, Rabia, why this question of favor versus security interest is even up for debate. I, I mean, I think this this idea of favor is really a Pakistani way of looking at relationships. I mean, why should any country do Pakistan a favor? And why should Pakistan do any country a favor? So uh, I think your, your book, unfortunately, comes out at a time when we are back in that trough of the US-Pakistan relationship where, the, where you know, we are busy telling the world how ungrateful this friend has been. And the US is doing exactly the same thing. In fact, if the US had done Pakistan a favor, it would be crazy. It's as simple as that. Um, and so, you know, I, I, that to me is not a binary at all that, that is even under consideration. Similarly, if it is about national security, I don't know why Pressler is a surprise. And I don't know why Pakistan is upset about Pressler. I mean, why sh what should the US have done at that time? Said, great, you are through with this, and now we will support you in, in making sure that you get to the bomb as well as you want. I mean, that doesn't make sense. Similarly, for Pakistan to essentially not play this game of deception or whatever you want to call it, I've never understood the point here. I mean, Pakistan needed to get to something, and they did whatever it took, right? So I, I think we should leave this idea of so the jilted lover and favor and ungrateful and all of that out of strategy and it'll help us all. Um, even now, quite frankly, for the past 10 and 15 years that I've been looking at US Pakistan and doing this, I really get tired of both sides saying, you know, I hear in, in the US Pakistanis lie, as if this is the only country that does that. And I get tired of people talking in Pakistan and saying, these guys are very ungrateful as if you're a married couple where you, you know, got something wrong. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. Anyways, too, uh, too long. The question, why don't you have a theoretical framework in the book? Because I think it's perfectly set up with all the history that you have 
to explain exactly this idea of national security and strategy. And to me, quite frankly, the framework would have been rationality. You essentially go back to the basis of realism and the problem of states defining rationality themselves. It's like beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder. And then looking at whether the US and Pakistan were rational or had gone off the realism chart, if you will, as they did this. And I think your answer would have been two perfectly realist um, entities operating for their own goals. Um, you should begin, and then I won't get Brigada uh, Feroz Hassan Khan to talk about the wrestler also. But just one thing with, with reference to um, this idea of favor and this idea of uh, having been jilted and all that. So, so this, there is a problem on, on the, the American side also in terms of the op-eds and the rest of it that you get. But on our side, it's much more problematic because right from the time that we go through uh, schooling, we get to read stuff about which the late Professor K.K. Aziz said it was the murder of history. So we have deliberately, willfully, not just uh, excised history, uh, not just selected it, everyone does that, but also deliberately distorted it. And then, of course, if you have 30 channels or 40 channels uh, with the so-called experts who can speak from agriculture to nuclear weapons from 7 p.m. to 11 uh, p.m. every day uh, through the week, giving you uh, a certain kind of perspective on international relations or interstate relations, then this is exactly what you'll get. Because you coming to this from a realist perspective, and of course from a realist perspective it doesn't make any sense to even talk about or say that someone has lied or someone has deceived or that, you know, uh, any of the many other things. Uh, we, if we can start from 65. Oh, why were we embargoed? I mean, that was the end user agreement. The, the equipment was not given to you to, to fight against India. It was part of what was called in sanitary against communism. So all of this has been fed to us. Some of us has broken free of this by reading stuff that, is, that actually tells you how it was. But many of us remain confined in those, in those chains uh, and this process goes on. Uh, but yeah. Rabia. So thank you so much. So yeah, um, unfortunately, um, you know, this is how uh, Pak-US relationship is understood in Pakistan in a very, uh, with a very limited sense that it, as if it is a marital relationship. And you know, you, you hear references to being divorced and not getting divorced or near a divorce. And, and so that framework is what uh, a general audience that you know, uh, knows anything about Pakistan, U.S. looks looks at it through this prism, and unfortunately, so um, you know, in, in my work, I don't talk of it as a favor or whatever. But my one of the, one of the terms um, that I have used that Pakistan does not owe it to anybody to explain as to why it did what it did was taken out of context and uh, shared with me that you know this this line doesn't fit here because it was not a favor that was done and i had this argument back and forth with this gentleman which i'm not going to whom i'm not going to name here but sits at a very significant position so that tells me that we are still despite trying to break free after having written or what feroz has written or what you have written on the subject ultimately at the end of the day this is the prism through which for a long time, Pakistanis are going to look at this relationship. Um, so so if, when I made these remarks, those were for, you know, so that it's easier for people to understand that wasn't a favor. Um, why uh, was uh, Pressler a surprise? It was not a surprise. Um, George uh, Bush wrote a letter to Journal Asar Khan um, literally uh, sort of, you know, uh, in a, ap apologizing. Um, and sort of like saying it as it is that, you know, 
there is nothing that they can do because according to the language of Pressler, this has automatically been triggered. And Ghulam Asad Khan does not seem surprised and does not say that, look what you've done to us and we're going down the drain because of this. So he took it on a very, you know, uh, realistic terms. It is the narrative that has been shaped around Presla, not having known what the language stands for, not having known what the triggers were, just um, you know, projecting a narrative so that you could live uh, with a post-Cold War situation uh, and blame it on the US for leaving you high and dry when actually it wasn't the case. So, so in this chapter, uh, where I discuss uh, the post Pressler, uh, you know, uh, in Bush administration thing, I do write about it. Um, why don't I have a theoretical framework? So I, uh, so like I said, this was an interdisciplinary department, and uh, there is a lot of tensions in the U.S. between historians and political scientists. And if it was a political science PhD, it would have had a full-fledged theoretical framework. And I would have probably spent two more years of doing, just getting that right. Um, but my history professor, um, whose work I've, he's a Sovietologist and I've read his work and all, and he was like, you know, there's no need of a theoretical framework. Just write history. Just, just interpret the evidence that you have. And, um, but, but my dissertation committee had both the political scientist and the historian, so I had to please the political scientist, and actually my dissertation has a theoretical framework chapter, uh, which I, could no, I did not have time to uh, you know, polish off and uh, put it in a manner to sink in with the rest of the arguments, so it's totally my laziness that I, I took it out. But it's a standalone thing in itself, and you're very right, you know, it does gel well. There needs to be a theoretical lens to go with it. So I'll stop here. Yeah, just a, a brief remark on the, on the theoretical part. Moid, you and I suffered the Stanford University press problem. So that's an academic press, and they would push you, they would push you so much on that. The hardest time that I had in the publication of my book was on that theoretical framework that it really, they really grill you a lot, you know. So yeah, you're right, I mean, I mean there were many people who said just write it like this. And my first draft was actually it was without a framework. And it came back hardly because it's an international IR theory thing. So it's, in some context it is very important for the academia to come. I hope your book will come out in a different shape somewhere else. Just one point. Preston, I did not. I missed out in my remarks and I wanted to say something. Last December when I was here, every time I come on leave here, I have to write a review. Last year I wrote the book review of Pressler uh, when it came out. And uh, I think it was published in the Herald, Dawn or something. Yeah. And I, I, I want to promote myself, but you should read that. Really, I stick it into him because, you know, uh, that one. Ezra but, Tabia, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you, uh, so, you know, I mean, I will mean, leave that. But the point is, because it comes in your book is, and, the, and the point that you have raised about. Uh, I think you really capture as to how it all started and why it started. And you quote Najimuddin Sheikh in your book. I, I can give you some more take because I did some more research on that at the time. The Pakistani authorities did know that Pressler was in the making. It did happen with their knowledge. And they knew that as long as it is in the certification hand of the president, oh, chalta hai yaar, president ko haath mein jai, you know. They didn't realize what, 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 what your book alludes to, and correct me if I'm wrong, that they understood the implication. I don't think so. Anybody understood the implication at the time? Even in 1989 and 1990 is the thing I was referring to. Because at the time, in 89, when General Baig went in the spring of 89 that you mentioned in your book, he was very clearly told that this is a new president and this is probably you may get the certification and you will not get the certification until and unless Prime Minister Bhutto comes and tells the Joint Congress to do that. The certification of 1989 was because Benazir Bhutto addressed a joint parliament and pledged right there, it's in your book as well, in my book as well. That is what got you the certificate in 89. And in no uncertain term, 
Brent Scowcroft told General Baig, this is not going to happen. So w given that larger context, either you ignored it because whatever things that happened in 1990, those statements, General Baig told me that those designs were done actually to sort of instigate Americans to tell we are going crazy so that they tell their friends India to stop it here as a means of signaling deterrence at the time. And he believes, Rabia, they truly believe that the Robert Gates mission was triggered because of that activity, not because of any other thing. I would still summarize that they still did not understand the implication of Pressler, particularly that the F-16 will be lying in Arizona. That's, I just wanted to say that, so. Can I just yeah. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. sure. Just, uh, okay. Yeah, uh, on that argument of favor, and I think it, it's important, Muid, because I, as a student of uh, strategic studies, when I started reading the subject, I had this uh, underlying hostility towards the United States of being abandoned, because this is how it's being taught. This is uh, initially in our programs, right? This is what the debate is in the, uh, in the most popular TV shows that we want to sit through at 8 o'clock. Right? So I, I feel that there are two parts of it. One is that uh, um, the administrations uh, within Pakistan have been using it to sort of shift the blame when it talks about uh, sometimes the issues. And the other part is that with, it, with the US administration itself, this has been, um, the, the, the argument has been coming up as sort of a political bargaining chip. And Rabia talks about it in when she is talking about the whole um, the, the debate on the uh, prospective Pakistani PME. <coughs> That didn't happen. The, the peaceful nuclear explosion, and that at that time it was being used as a political bargaining chip. So I, I do feel that uh, uh, bringing it up is important. That uh, of course nations never do favor against others. It's the national interest that prevails. It is a Machiavellian concept, and this is how it has to be. But bringing it up is important so that people come to know that there there are national interests that will remain supreme. There are ge geopolitical interests. We have seen it in the Iran Iranian case. The larger geopolitical concept was absent, and we uh, can now see the U.S. Uh, sort of uh, getting back on uh, looking at the issue in a broader geopolitical context. Um, just, just one thing about publishing in the U.S. and public publishing it in Pakistan. The reviewers wanted me, if I wanted to be read in the U.S., this was explicitly written, if I wanted to be read in the U.S., I needed to be more like Hussein Akani in you know, making statements about Pakistan. And um, I wasted two years for that, and I decided that I will take from those reviews whatever I can take, and um, you know, have it published from a Pakistani platform, even if it was an unknown platform. At least the word will get out, and it will be read um, the way I wanted people to read it, uh, without you know, polishing it in any other way or making it more palatable for the American audience. Any further questions? Um, uh, uh, firstly, sir, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Rabia for doing this excellent work because there's so much being written by the Indians and by the Jews about Pakistan rather than Pakistan is writing about Pakistan and hardly anything, you go to any reasonable library, try to do some research, you hardly you can, like you have also quoted the number of books that have been written on strategic issues on your fingertips. And what is happening is that a narrative is not selling. And a researcher in the West wants to write something about Pakistan, he doesn't have a perspective. And he's bound to write what the Indians want them to write, or the US wants them to write. So they're handicapped. So most of the, uh, of the, of the, of these literature that is coming out from the West is biased against us. And that puts on the vicious circle of telling people that peop the West is against us and you know because they don't get the right perspective. So on that account, I think I'd like to congratulate her, congratulate her for doing an excellent thing which most of us are not doing. And same goes to the panel and the other writers over here. Uh, so my question is, uh, are you all of you to the panel, is that since Pakistan went through this and you know we, we managed to get this uh, the bomb, you know, despite the world not liking it to us and putting all kind of pressure. Do you think this thing happening again with any other country doing this kind of feat uh, despite all the international pressures, particularly Iran and other those who are trying to get this? 
Um, at the cost of becoming unpopular. I think, again, I, I want to stress, research is not to promote narratives. Research is to investigate. So, I think, sir, what you're saying is correct. But if 50 Pakistanis were to write books tomorrow, all critical, would we count those or not count those? That's the problem of the mindset. So, I let researchers investigate no matter what they write. Yes, more Pakistanis should write. But as I think others said and I said, you can't write not because we don't want to write. You can't write because there's no evidence and accessibility to evidence. That's fundamentally the problem here. Um, the uh, question I wanted to ask is actually for Ijaz and, and others. Um, Rabbi, you mentioned, and, and Firozab, you mentioned that Pakistan knew Pressler, you know, etc. And did not fully understand the implications, <coughs> perhaps, is, is your view. Here's my question. 30 years down, we're in another situation, Afghanistan, settlement, what will happen after that? It is identical to Pressler. The views I hear about what will happen, what the U.S. is doing, how it will happen, are so far removed from reality. So my question to you is, do we never learn? Is there no, or, or maybe let me ask you this, why don't we learn? Is the system not geared um, to introspect? Is the system not set up in a way where you could draw from that what may have been right or wrong? Uh, because right now, I'll give you an empirical sort of example of this. I've been talking to people here and say, as soon as Afghanistan is over, you'll be back to the 1990 moment. And there are two responses I get. One is, nahi, 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 humare wo kya karenge? And the other one is, ha, Amerikan to hai hi aise, India ke saath mile hai, ye karna chahte. Is there no analysis in the system that can tell us why this may happen and how to fix it? Um, you know, I, I just want to know about that. And just, Saima, for for your consumption, I never said that Pakistan should not be upset. Pakistan should absolutely be upset. The US did abandon Pakistan after a year, uh, decade of partnership. It's not a favor or no favor. Pakistan should absolutely be upset. It was a partner for, for a decade and it was dumped. And it may be dumped again. Uh, so we can be upset, but not look at this as a good uh, sort of spouse or a bad spouse. Just look at it as what, okay. what happened. Since this spouse an analogy has come up multiple times, uh, I'll send you uh, an article that I wrote uh, some years ago, which actually refers to this relationship uh, as uh, Edward Albee's uh, play, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, where Martha and George, especially the act two, which is called Walpurgis Nacht, The Night of the Witches, uh, it's an abusive relationship. And um, I won't say any more, but um, I know you have uh, deliberately uh, remained uh, happily uh, devoid of literature, Moeed, but you need to read that play. It's a, it's a great play. Uh, as far as uh, analysis, in fact, um, I, was, I was talking to uh, the Commodore here uh, that when Naseem Zara's book on Kargil uh, was launched, I mentioned that uh, there was a young captain uh, who uh, went in as part of Operation Gibraltar. And then 34 years down the line, there was another young captain uh, who uh, was part of the Kargil operation. And the first young captain uh, was my father and the father of the young captain who was sent to Kargil. So the point really being uh, in 34 years, did we learn anything? And I think you know you've done so much work on organization theory and you know about bounded rationality and systematic stupidity and the fact that you know organizations tend to reify their worldview. So even when there are lone voices which would understand that what you're doing is not right, you still somehow organizationally you move into that, into that direction. Um, and because much of the, the core aspects of foreign policy 
uh, have been dominated by the military. So you have the security policy, which is a tail wagging the foreign policy, which is a dog. And that is obviously not a sensible situation. So there are a number of reasons for that, which obviously would need a different session to discuss. But um, okay. you want to say something? Yeah, well, there are actually three questions answered. One of the questions was the first one you answered about compromised silence. Is that your question? Yes. Yeah, I mean, no, I used, you asked about the compromise silence, and I'm just answering that part, you know, basically that. There was in part compromise silence, but in countries where there are stove piping and there are leaks, there are so many other things happening, compromise silence between the two governments do not remain compromised, you know, and it gets leaks into... that they were silent about the activities going on? Did they bring it out that this type of relationship is going on between India and Pakistan, that on face value they are saying that uh, they have to enforce the policy, but there is enforcement failure on part of the US? How was it taken by the monitoring agents, whatever they were, with other security members, uh, non uh, there, there are no monitoring agents at yeah. the international level. Um, U.S. was the leader and what it wanted to, you know, the way it was running the regime with the non-proliferation treaty being the, being at the, the, the pillar of it, there were a lot of uh, contradictions in its own policies at that time. So um, at one point, at one forum, talking to different governments, it was talking about what Pakistan is doing. They knew about AQ Khan from the moment, you know, uh, he had thought of stealing uh, stuff and then bringing it to Pakistan. Uh, so, uh, so, so for the optics of it, at the international level, they kept making noise within those circles who were listening, but you know, did not do anything about it until 2004. So it's easier for them to now say that you have AQ Khan and he lied and he stole and all that. And that was my reply to Christian Fair at one of the my first ever meeting with her uh, three years ago. And, and I said that everything that Pakistan did was under the U.S. nose. There's not even a single thing that Pakistan did that the U.S. Ha did not have knowledge about. But what did you choose to do about it? Nothing, right? Because it served your purpose. Pakistan was serving your purpose. So uh, let's not say who lied to whom, and you know, because that's really counterproductive terminology. I'll just uh, um, you know, take one minute to tell you about, uh, I wrote a little piece uh, based on a document that I came across. So when Brzezinski and Christian Warren visited Zia here in Islamabad in 1980, um, this is what Zia said to him about Pakistan-US relationship being uh, a halal relationship and that of marriage. An antidote of the superpower is another superpower. This is Zia telling Brzezinski. The USSR is too much for us with or without Indian support. We could not cope with that attack even if we had a massive military program of the kind you have provided to Egypt. Such a close love lock may be impossible right now after the past differences we have had in Islam. Marriage contracts contain various stipulations even including the amount of alimony to be paid in case of divorce. There is much talk of temporary marriage these days. The US and Pakistani relationship, however, is not such a temporary marriage, but an Islamic marriage. <laughs> <laughs> this is Zia on record. Do you want to say something? Do you want to say something? That's a question whether this could be abolated. Where other countries are not. I'll give you a blunt answer, you know. Pakistan is the only Muslim country, in my view, that has gotten away with because it did it at a certain time when the non-proliferation regime and its monitoring was much more evolving. In my opinion, the same methodology used and the same diplomacy used or same statecraft used, if emulated by another country now, is more likely to fail, as many countries have found out recently. So my answer no, is probably. Some other model. Do you think this is happening again? Okay. You know, maybe another, you know, geostrategic situation or you know something like that. 
Yeah, I mean, if you are asking the question that when the national security motivation is so high to achieve, all obstacles will be crossed by the nation. If it has the same level of resolve and unanimity within the state polity, as was in the case of Pakistan, any other country will still do it. I'm talking particularly with respect to Iran. Iran, yes. Yeah, Iran is the case, in my view, Iran's case is a very peculiar one because it, it, it has gotten away with hedging capability. And once you have crossed a certain capability, no matter how much you do, eventually you'll come back with it. You know, it's, Iran has done very prudently. It has thought that it is counterproductive to push it through. They, they backed off. The capability will go nowhere. They, it's only a matter of time, you know. They got 15, 10 years. You know, you know how this administration is pushing back. It's a game going on. But Iran has decided that it will not go into what is called, you know, like full-fledged proliferation. They backed off. Uh, and in Pakistan case, they could, you could not have backed on. That's what you could have hep, kept hedging for a long time. But given the pressure that India was moving in that space, you could not have done that. So Iran history is very different, you know. It's very different uh, kind of thing. Remember that Iran is now with Israel. It's not India, Pakistan, and It's very your, different. Your dynamic. opinion? Can you see in future, can it happen with Iran? Iran become a nuclear power, you know, asking you bluntly? Yeah, I think uh, it That's will. Yeah, I think it has the, it, it will have the heavy hedging capability. What way it decides, it will be the, the international environment. Yeah. Uh, on Iran, if I may quickly, uh, the JCPOA uh, is in fact uh, an indirect acknowledgement that Iran has a certain level of uh, capacity and what the J JCPOA does is to put a longer timeline on that. Now, people are obviously aware of the fact that the Iranians have a very uh, advanced missile program. You are unlikely to strike 3,000 kilometers away or 2,500 kilometers away with a tactical warhead. So obviously, it makes no sense. But, but the Iranians are OK with that because in the interim, they obviously needed some kind of respite, which they got. So some of the critics, and I'm not talking about the Trump administration, because the Trump administration is looking at the Iranian behavior quite apart from the, the requirements of the JCPOA. Uh, and as you know, the IAEA has certified that they are not in violation of that, but they are looking at the Iranian behavior in the broader context of real politics and the, and the supposed Iranian projection, power projection in the greater Middle East. So that is one of the, one of the reasons. But if you read al Baradi's book, al Baradi actually talks about the fact that they're going to be virtual nuclear weapon states. And it's just a matter of, you know, the turnkey kind of a thing. Because the, the non-proliferation regime is grounded in a level of discrimination which creates a tension. So the idea was in the, in the nuclear uh, non-proliferation treaty, the idea was that these are the, uh, the not the legitimate, but these are the accepted or acceptable nuclear weapon states. And the rest will declare that they are not going to go this side. But here's the quid pro quo. And the quid pro quo, among other things, was that there, there are going to be negotiations uh, in earnest by the P5 moving towards disarmament. But that has not happened. So that tension is, remains embedded in, in, the, in the entire structure of non-proliferation. If we were to look at another model, the nuclear blackmail model of a pariah state, North Korea is there. So you know, there, so from that from that perspective, I mean, Iran is one example, and then you have a, a state that withdrew from the NPT, went on for its program uh, for regime survival or for other means. You know, one can debate that. But you know, the models are there. When the resolve is there to attain it, and the current politics as it's shaping up, one really needs to see. I mean, the Trump's meeting with the, the North Korean head, and you know, the sort of legitimacy that gives to the program of a state that actually withdrew from the NPT. It's it's, it's an open question. Yes. If we hadn't done what we did before 9-11, or 9-11 had happened earlier, what would have been the situation? If 9-11 had happened earlier, earlier before, before Pakistan had conducted the nuclear test, you know. Like, I mean, he said in the very beginning, you know, there were two points, you know, one was Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the infection point one, and two, 
as a matter of fact, that history is yet to be written in greater details. Uh, what Pakistan did after 9-11, at least in the decade, at the time when 9-11 happened, Pakistan only had a demonstrated nuclear capability. 9-11 gave you the operational deterrent capability and an advanced nuclear power. And by the way, that's also a blind eye, at least the Bush administration. That is not written there because it is, uh, and you know, you have ramped up all the plutonium production after 9-11. Just, just, just a fact, you know, if that is what you mean in terms of capability. But I think you're alluding to something that if you were not a nuclear power, what might have been the reaction in Pakistan, you know, in terms of its national security, you know. It's a very counterfactual sort of a thing. In my view, if Pakistan had not gone in that timeline nuclear capability, you would have had at least three wars with India by then. Mm -hmm. Three yeah. major wars with India. Yeah. What the capability has done is it has prevented a major war with India. Nuclear deterrence has worked in Pakistan's history, that's my belief. Uh, and uh, the, the, your capability has provided that. So there may have been an element of deterrence and India and other actors might have acted differently were you not a nuclear power at the time. That's my, that's my view. Another small, small question. Uh, I think Brigadier Feroz is privy to it. Was it effective when Zia told Kissinger or somebody that look, our program is India specific, not Israel specific? Or Something, I mean, yes. it's not him only. West. Every Pakistan leader to date has said the same thing. And that assurance to the Israelis has always been given. And that's a, that, that is actually accurate and that is true also. It so it's factual. not anyone is lying. Yes, even, it is factual. Even post Shine 3 with the rain. Yes, and rain, and Shine 3. So uh, uh, Pakistan uh, program uh, is uh, not uh, specific uh, to any other country. I think this answers the question. Yes, uh, I, yes. I mean, I'm very, uh, yeah, yeah. and there is no policy of that kind. To, to do so, you know. And by the way, since you mentioned Zia, again, since there's also a sort of a myth that Zia Ullak in his meeting with Rajiv Gandhi threatened with something mm. uh, yeah. during a cricket, yes. cricket match, that is not true. Mm. It's not true. Yes, that's not true. Anyway, on that note, um, I will uh, formally close the session. Uh, just one thing uh, on the table uh, with reference to uh, deterrence and the fact that we have fortunately not have had three wars with India, but here's the thing. Uh, since Kargil, the Indians have been uh, actually working on, uh, on, on the whole idea of limited war, uh, short and sharp. Um, they called it Cold Star, they started calling it the proactive ops. Uh, so there is, they believe that there is a band in which they can operate just short of the Pakistani red lines. So, so the problem now is, and I think Moeed's book uh, discusses it uh, in greater detail, the problem now is that you are operating in a nuclear environment and you actually think that there is a band in which you can fight conventionally and without really moving up the, the escalation ladder towards uh, the nuclear thing. It worked during the Cold War, the stability and stability paradox that we talk about, but that was because the, proxy, the, 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 the periphery was unstable and there were proxy wars going on. The center was stable. I don't think we have the physical space for that uh, between India and Pakistan. So uh, that uh, essentially leads us to, uh, to uh, perhaps greater instability uh, rather than more stability. But uh, thank you so much. Let's give a big hand to the discussants also and the author. Also. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, one minute. Yes, yes, uh, please. So I, 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 Rabia, I have to present this book to you and sure. your faculty. Have and, uh, you know, for, you, and I want to say something that usually people say that, you know, this is a Bible in the U.S. and other places. I want to tell you this is one book written at a certain point of time. This is a primer. And this is just a basic research. There should be many more emanating out of that. Or if you want to do it, you can share it. 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 Share it.